Okay, so we are here for another media law chat with my, um, wow, everything, dear, dear friend, former student, fellow media law geek, Erica Saltkin. So Erica, introduce yourself and tell us what uh, case we're teeing up today. Sure. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Erica Saltkin. I am a proud UW uh, three-peat. So I got both, or all my, my undergrad, my grad, uh, master's degree, and my PhD from the University of Wisconsin. I am currently talking to you from Spokane, Washington. So pine trees behind me. This is my world now, uh, where I teach at Whitworth University, which is a small uh, private liberal arts university. Uh, and I teach in our journalism and media studies program. So a little bit of everything. And uh, super grateful for the opportunities I had at the UW. Super grateful for the opportunities I had to learn from your teacher. So if you don't love Katie, love Katie. <laughs> uh, and uh, and my, my area of research is student press, student media um, law, and student speech. So All right. that's sort of my fascination, that's my world, and that's why I'm here to talk to you today about Hazelwood. All right, Hazelwood, the case that people love to hate. <laughs> so, uh, so the students are all familiar uh, with the basics of the case, but are there any known, uh, any little known aspects or surprising parts of this case that you think are worth mentioning? Well, first of all, folks, if you have not yet done this, uh, go to Google, Google Hazelwood B. Kuhlmeyer, click on images so you can see what Kathy Hazel or Kathy uh, Kuhlmeyer looked like because yes, folks, that is how we wore our hair in the 1980s. <laughs> big hair, gorgeous big hair. <laughs> so the, the timeline for the story is really important because the spectrum had a really engaged, really um, active faculty advisor who left right before all of this happened. So those of you who were on your high school newspapers, um, and had really active, engaged advisors. You may have read this and said, how on earth did the advisor just sit back and let this happen? And that's a, an important part of this story because it's important for us to remember that student media advisors are a big part of these conversations. And it's a big reason why more and more of these pieces of uh, legislation that are happening at the state level, they're often called new voices laws that protect student media and that kind of push back against the Hazelwood decision are also seeking to protect the advisors of these student media to ensure that these teachers don't risk their jobs advocating on behalf of their students. So that's, I think, an important piece to remember is that this long running, uh, very active advisor had left and there was sort of a sub filling in to make sure that the last um, issue of the newspaper did get out before hmm. a new person would be coming in the following year. And so what were the, what, what was the school district so, or the school so upset about? Like how, what was this content and how shocking was it? <laughs> uh, oh, well, by the way, your, your laptop is bouncing around a little bit. So apologies. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I go up here. <laughs> <laughs> So the, um, I believe it was a vice principal who was doing, and, and they had a pattern of prior review. So this was not new in terms of an administrator taking a look at content before it was sent to the printer. But that, uh, that administrator was concerned about uh, an article on teen pregnancy that included the story of a student who at that high school had been a pregnant teen. The students had used a pseudonym but the administrator didn't believe it was, it was enough to protect this, this young woman's identity. Uh, there was a story too about divorce and uh, a student who'd been quoted in it said some things about uh, their parents, I, I believe specifically their father, father yeah. that they, the administrator thought could have potentially been libelous and mm -hmm. was concerned about uh, the school's um, kind of legal liability in case that parent decided to uh, to protect his reputation. So those were the big concerns uh, in looking. And so because it was the last issue of the semester, uh, the administrator didn't feel like there was time to go back and do edits or revisions. So instead just directed the printer to leave those pages off. Mm -hmm. Now it's not like, you know, those of you who been on student newspapers know one page is rarely one article. So all the other articles 
uh, that were on those pages were also removed from the publication. So why is this important? You know, it's, it's just high school students. They're just gossiping about teen pregnancy and divorce, whatever. Why, why does this really matter? Well, you can answer that from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, first, from sort of a sociological perspective, there's a lot of research out there that shows that student media is a really important learning opportunity for young people who are on the cusp of adulthood to start understanding what it means to live in an environment that prizes free speech and free press. So the, it's a silly uh, kind of comparison, but it's one that works, I find, for a lot of students in my classes. Think about Harry Potter. Stay with me. So if you are a Harry Potter fan, you know that in book five, they had a very controversial defense against the dark arts instructor who would not let them use their wands. Instead, she said, if you read the content in the textbook and understand the theory, then should the need arise, you'll be able to actually use the skill. And of course, you know, you read that and you went, well, that's just plain ridiculous. <laughs> But the concept applies when we talk about free speech and free press as well. If we're just going to talk about it in a sort of broad theoretical um, way in high schools and not actually allow young people to engage in those rights um, within, of course, a learning context, then nothing magical happens when they turn 18 and suddenly they have those full rights protected. Um, outside of the academic environment. And so the learning lab that student media provides is essential to developing that constitutional skill. So that's first. Second, student media outlets are the only ones dedicated to that student community. And so the ability for these newspapers to, to publish um, effectively on what is relevant to those communities serves not only the students who are creating that media work, but the students who are reading that media work. Mm -hmm. And to say that for any young people in the late 1980s or now, that issues of teen pregnancy, issues of divorce, issues of mental health, anything like that is not relevant to that student community as somebody who doesn't understand the lived experience of young people right now. So Hazelwood is important because it ended up creating common law that made the ability for students to engage in those benefits much more difficult. Uh, and it failed to recognize those educational benefits, those civic engagement benefits, um, those, you know, those learning opportunities on behalf of the 90% of uh, American teenagers who go to public schools. Now, of course, we already knew the 10% that were going to private schools didn't have those rights anyway. Yeah, un but, unless, unless granted by the private institution, and some right. are better than others in encouraging mm -hmm. that development. You know, I think a really fascinating element to all of this, and one of the things that's always really bothered me about the Hazelwood case, um, is this idea that all of a sudden you receive your high school diploma and you are somehow now a, a you know, fully rights-bearing citizen, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you should be able to practice those, use those rights responsibly when we have not given you the chance to do that beforehand. So you know, I, I don't know that a person automatically becomes a responsible speaker at any point in time when that person has not had the opportunity to fully exercise speech rights. It's, it's a, it's, um, you know, it seems to me that school should be a place where you do learn some difficult lessons um, mm -hmm. and you make some mistakes and you fall down and you get back up again from those mistakes. What do you think people get wrong about the Hazelwood case quite often? To be honest, that people classify it purely as a student speech case. Because if you read Hazelwood, first and foremost, it's a forum case. The first thing the court goes into with its uh, analysis is whether or not the spectrum is a public forum. And subsequently, the Hazelwood decision has been used in a wide variety of situations that have nothing to do with student newspapers or student yearbooks. It's been used to censor teacher speech. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we lump it in, right, the, the big four when we talk about student speech cases. So Tinker, Frazier, Hazelwood, and Morse. We, we put it in there because it emerged out of the schools. Mm -hmm. But first, it's a forum case. And it's in doing so, 
the court almost takes this away from being student speech. It's talking about this as a vehicle of expression on behalf of the school mm -hmm. as opposed to the students. And you know, the Tinker decision told us students are not passive conduits of learning, right? They don't just sit there and absorb everything that's being spilled on them. They are supposed to be active learners. What better way to be an active learner than to join your student newspaper staff? Right. But by using forum analysis here, the court robs the students of that active role in their education by saying, well, first and foremost, this is a school medium of speech. And so let's talk about whether or not the school has opened it up for greater discussion or if this is the school's ability to regulate its own speech, mm -hmm. which is a little frustrating when you look at the argument that the students were making, which is our voice has been silenced here. Right. Right. And I think that's also beyond frustrating, a little terrifying when it comes to people who would extend Hazelwood to the um, higher education level, to colleges and universities, where the very first question becomes, well, is this a school sponsored newspaper? Mm -hmm. You know, do, do the Badger Herald or the Daily Cardinal receive any funding from the university? That always just shocks the heck out of me because I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> why, why in the world would we start at that question? Why don't we start at the question of these are, are adults who are not in um, some kind of forced uh, setting. You know, they can come and go much more freely than a K through 12 student could. Why are we ever applying Hazelwood to an analysis involving a college or university? But it certainly has happened. Absolutely. It's happened with a student newspaper and it's happened with a student yearbook. Yeah. Yeah, very, very terrifying. So where do we stand today? What do you do you think there's ever a chance for I, I know you would love for Hazelwood <laughs> to come back for for some new argument. Uh, do you think there's ever a chance we're going to revisit this or where it would stand with today's kind of court? I don't know how it would stand with today's court. To be honest, I, I'm not real confident that today's court would be particularly good to to student speech. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, fairly deferential to authority, you know, the power of the executive, uh, the power of educators, uh, the power of parents. Absolutely. And subsequently, I think this trend by the states to pass state legislation that kind of reinforces the, the rights of young people in their public high schools and in a couple of states in their private high schools as well mm. uh, to oh, really? engage in speech that um, that would normally be protected but for the tinker standard so a lot of them make reference to that so we still do need to uh, respect the rights of an academic setting to do what it was created to do but to protect that speech and to protect the teachers who advise those student newspapers that i think is probably the the thing we need to watch that's the the better solution uh, because while we have to rely on a state-by-state -state process, and sometimes those are challenging. It took the state of Washington two tries to get our new voices law through, but we did last year. Uh, so it's a little bit more labor intensive, but it does create a more comprehensive protection, uh, at least for the students within that state. I don't see this getting changed at the Supreme Court level. I think it's at the state level that we need to look for, for greater protection for young people and, and their media. All right, so if we want these budding citizens to really learn to exercise their rights, advocating for that kind of statutory protection would be a good way for them to do it. About how many states have this kind of protection now? Oh, goodness. Uh, I'm going to get this number wrong. It doesn't have to be an exact number. Are we talking one dozen or four dozen? Oh, closer to one dozen. I think yeah. we're somewhere around 15 or 16 right now, with a bunch of states that have legislation at least rolling. You know, it, you have to get that support in the legislature in some mm -hmm. states. I remember when, because uh, I was in high school in Wisconsin, when Wisconsin attempted to pass its, and at the time they were anti-Hazelwood laws. Uh, <laughs> and I remember going to the Capitol and testifying oh. um, in, in favor of this protection. Um, and they, they were randomly drawing names and I think I was the third person to speak. I was terrified. <laughs> but just being there and saying, here's why we think it's so important. Uh, the legislature actually passed it, Tommy Thompson vetoed it, uh, which was a little disappointing, uh, but being a part of that process, and you know, again, um, all y'all, if you haven't read the dissent in Hazelwood, read the dissent. 
uh, because there's some really powerful language there about you know the young people of Hazelwood High School um, getting a civics lesson that they didn't expect. Uh, and it's one that I've gone back to again and again when uh, we had um, the school shootings and we had young people really trying mm -hmm. to rise up and say, um, this can't keep happening. That's the thing that always pops in my mind. And that's the thing I always share with the people, with the students that I talk with is, this is a civics lesson and will it be the civics lesson we expect or will it be the civics lesson that disappoints us uh, but every time we come together uh, and and exercise those rights and say um, i have you know the ability in this country to say what i believe is right and to advocate peacefully for my uh for those rights or for change that i think that needs to happen that's us you know engaging in some of the, the most basic civic education we can. Um, and we need to support that as best we can. All right. Well, I have to say, as, as your former teacher, I couldn't be more proud to see the <laughs> fantastic scholar you have become, the engaged educator that you are. It just makes me very, very proud. So thank you for um, raising your voice way back in the state legislature in Wisconsin, advocating for student news media all the way to today, advocating for your own students and for expression rights for all of us. So again, thank you, uh, Erica Salkin from Whitworth University. It was a pleasure to talk with you today. I'm so glad I could be here. All right. Have a great day, Erica. You too. Bye-bye.